Good afternoon. My name is Hannah and I am the social media manager here at COSI. Thank you for joining me today for the 2021 COSI Science Festival. The festival has moved from a four day physical festival to an all digital format May 5th through 8th. On May 8th, we hope you will connect virtually with at home science activities and share your experience with photos or videos on social media using hashtag COSI SciFest. And of course, we want to give a big shout out to all of our sponsors and partners of the COSI Science Festival, especially our visionary sponsor, Vitell. We certainly couldn't do this without them. Want to show your support for COSI? We are nominated once again for USA Today's 10 Best Science Museum. You can vote for COSI by visiting COSI.org backslash 10 best. And don't forget, COSI opens to the public on June 3rd. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Taylor, and I'm a climate scientist at NASA Langley Research Center. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. So I wanted to start off by telling you guys a story. Uh, so it was in the fourth grade that I vowed to become a meteorologist. And it was after a month long section on the weather. Mrs. Benner, my fourth grade teacher, gave me the role of being chief data logger. This is where I came in every day and I wrote the temperature and the dew point and the wind measurements on the board every morning. Uh, the, the digital readout monitor for our school's weather station was actually located in our classroom, so it was, it was really convenient. But you know, after that lesson, I was hooked. I really just needed to know and wanted to know what made the atmosphere tick. My first love was clouds. Uh, as a child, I found them both fascinating and mysterious, and I spent a lot of summer afternoons watching them float by. In fact, clouds really still inspire me today. You know, that, that inspiration and that curiosity that was sparked in Mrs. Benner's first grade class still drives me today. But, you know, there's more. You know, at that time, I had no idea that this curiosity would turn into a passion around such an important challenge to our community and our world, that is, understanding our climate. Over the years, uh, my science questions have expanded uh, from trying to understand the weather at a, driving the temperature and the winds at an individual weather station at elementary school to how our gl global climate system works and how energy flows around it and how our environment is changing and how those changes in the environment affect our ability to live the life that each of us wants. You know, it's that thinking about these interactions that has led me on this path to NASA, NASA Langley Research Center, located on that map, including uh, receiving the 2013 Presidential Early Career Award uh, and getting to meet President Obama. So it's pretty amazing. I find it amazing that my journey to NASA really began with a series of weather lessons in the fourth grade. So while this curiosity started me down this path, uh, it is the ability to do the most good for society and for our community that really keeps me coming into work every day. Knowing that something I can learn today can save lives tomorrow and make our community a better place for both my daughters and all of our kids to grow up is really extremely empowering. Being a climate scientist provides me this opportunity because climate impacts our everyday lives. However, this isn't a fact that I've really always appreciated. <laughs> when I was a graduate student studying clouds and climate at Florida State University, I knew that you know, a five degree Fahrenheit warming of, of, our, of our world, of our, our, our planet, was a big deal for our climate system. You know, it would change our clouds, it would change the weather patterns. But what I really didn't appreciate at the time is that it would have such a big impact on our everyday lives. In fact, I, I, I didn't think it would. Uh, however, I was wrong. There are some things from that time in my life that I had taken for granted and neglected to consider. You know, I didn't really begin appreciating this really close, intimate tie between our environment and our lives until I started working at NASA and started to try to apply what I knew about our climate uh, to make our world a better place to live. Specifically, I started thinking about kind of where our uh, water came from, where the water we drink comes from, where the food I eat came to me, got to me, and the energy that I used, how it was generated. You know, in graduate school, when I was just studying clouds and climate, I had taken those things for granted. But when you sit down and think about those things, you start to figure out that those systems that bring us food and generate energy and water are all vulnerable to climate change because they're, they're sensitive to our climate. For instance, food and water availability is influenced by how much it rains, how hard it rains, and what the temperatures are outside. 
the amount of energy that we use to heat or cool our homes depends on the temperature outside as well. Our health and the health of our environment uh, is, is also influenced by the temperature and the quality of the air that we breathe. Our food, energy, and water systems, these systems that underpin our society, our community, uh, that we rarely think about, uh, are negatively affected by climate change and are vulnerable to climate change. So this is one message that I would love for you guys to take away with you, is that climate impacts our daily lives. Now, a second takeaway message that I have for you is that we live on an interconnected planet. This is one of the most important lessons that I've learned in my more than 15 year journey through science. And this means that our actions affect others and the actions of others affect us. Now this might be, that might sound trivial or obvious to anyone familiar with the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the epiphany that I had and what I learned uh, in studying climate science is that our climate system makes this principle operate at a global scale. And so what this means is that our actions influence the lives of other people, all other people on earth, and in fact, people that we will never meet. And I think that if we were able to internalize and implement this concept into our daily decisions, that we'd be able to make this world a better place, just one small decision at a time. So if I had one animation or one piece of NASA science that I could show you to kind of illustrate the interconnectedness of our climate system and our planet, this would be the one. Uh, this is an animation that shows uh, a, a simulation and data from NASA's GEOS modeling system. Uh, this is showing our atmosphere evolving and all of the different interconnected pieces. Whether it be the, if you look over Africa, those tan colors or the Saharan dust that's being lofted by the winds, carried across the Atlantic Ocean that is further dispersed globally, sometimes affecting cloud formations, or the swirls of clouds that are happening uh, around the United States in the middle latitudes in the middle of the globe that are uh, uh, indicating mid-latitude cyclones and storm systems that are carrying air from China into the U.S. and air from the U.S. up into Europe and into the Arctic. Our planet is interconnected. And at NASA, we collect data every day that illustrates this fact. You know, I haven't always understood the nature of these interconnections or fully appreciated their consequences. This is something that, that I learned throughout my journey through science. And I'd like to, to pose one question to you all uh, watching uh, to kind of drive these two takeaway points home. And that is, uh, do you think I would have a job as a, as a climate scientist here at NASA if it weren't for climate change? So the answer to that question is yes, yes I would. And the reason is because again, climate impacts our daily lives. The importance of climate science to our community and our world is independent of climate change. You know, climate change is the problem of today that we're spending a lot of time studying because it's the, the biggest problem that we have uh, in climate science that has a huge impact on our future. But in its absence, climate science still has a lot of value. For instance, just consider if we knew uh, very accurately in advance that this summer would be either exceptionally hot or exceptionally dry uh, or exceptionally wet, uh, this would help farmers plan and they'd be able to produce more food. This would help our city water managers help keep our water clean and be more efficient. Knowing that this winter would either have more or fewer snowstorms or, or more or fewer hurricanes where I live here in Southeast Virginia, uh, that would help city, cities plan. They'd be able to prioritize and operate more efficiently and that would end up saving money that we could divert into some other projects. Understanding and, and the predictions of climate uh, will help make our food, our energy, our water, economic health and security systems all more secure and more resilient. And data is one of those key necessary parts of this that enable us to have a better understanding of our climate system. And it's one of the most impactful things that NASA does because we really deal in data. Part of the biggest thing we do is to collect data on our planet. So the largest source of NASA data, it comes from our satellites. This is an, this is our, an animation of NASA's Earth observing fleet. These satellites measure a lot of different variables of our Earth, including temperature and clouds, dust, sea level, sea ice, ice sheets, and that's just a few of them. NASA currently operates more than 20 satellites. Uh, 
that focuses on a lot of different questions, but all aimed at understanding our planet for the benefit of all humankind. Now, one question you may have is, why are there so many satellites? I like to think of Earth's climate like a puzzle with many pieces, where the pieces of this puzzle are the atmosphere, the ocean, the plants, the animals, the ice, and of course humans. We play a really key role in this in the system. No one satellite is able to address all of these interconnected pieces. So we need many satellites in order to get the full picture. And from space, NASA has seen a lot of changes over the last 40 years. Uh, some of those biggest changes have happened in the Arctic. And what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And I'll come back to that point. But let me show you what NASA has learned over the last 40 years just by watching our planet change. One of the most talked about indicators of climate change and, and changes that we've seen in our planet is the increasing global surface temperature. What you're looking at here is an animation of the changes in global mean surface temperature seen in NASA data since 1880. Uh, in that time, the global mean temperature has warmed by about two degrees Fahrenheit. And that's indicated on this animation by the increasingly red colors across the planet. More striking than that is that the 20 warmest years in this record have all happened in the last 23 years, all of them since 1998. So what this means is that a 23-year-old person and a 100-year-old person have all lived through the warmest years on record. That's really an astonishing statement to say. NASA temperature data also shows that not everywhere has warmed equally across the globe. You can see that by these both the red and blue patches. And some of the places have warmed much faster than everywhere else. There's a feature I like to point out here that I call the red cap on the planet, and that's in the Arctic. That's showing that the Arctic has warmed more than twice as fast as the rest of the planet. I've spent a lot of uh, the last 10 years studying this problem as to why the Arctic is changing much more rapidly, understanding the causes that make it warm faster, and understanding how the changes in the Arctic what those changes mean for our community and the community of those living outside of the Arctic. Now, one of the most iconic images of Arctic climate change is the changing sea ice cover. This is an animation from NASA data showing uh, the September sea ice cover for every year since 1979 through present. And the white area that you're seeing here in behind the red line is the actual sea ice coverage in September in each of these years. The red line in front is showing you the total area in millions of square kilometers. The first thing that you can see by following the red line is that the Arctic sea ice in, in September has declined quite a bit since 1979, since we began satellite observations of the sea ice. But if you look at the data, it also shows that the last 14 years have all been the 14 lowest years on the record. Now, overall, uh, the average sea ice decline has been about 13% per decade since 1979. And that is equivalent to about 3 million square kilometers. I know it's hard to wrap your, wrap your mind around what 3 million square kilometers is. Uh, so let me put it into different terms. Uh, 3 million square kilometers is roughly equivalent to the land area of Alaska, Texas, California, and Montana combined. So when I put that statistic together, what I actually didn't fully appreciate is the, the vastness <laughs> of Alaska. Uh, in fact, Alaska's land area is about three times the size of Texas. <laughs> it's hard to tell that when you look at maps. but So that means that the amount of sea ice area that we've lost since 1979 is equivalent, is more than four times the size of Texas. So that's quite a lot of area. And that has very big implications for the climate of the Arctic, as well as how uh, our climate here in the lower 48. Another really interesting way of, of looking at sea ice and to considering how it changes uh, is tracking the age of the sea ice. Uh, the reason that we care about the age of the sea ice is because it is it was proportional to the thickness. It tells us a lot about how thick that sea ice is. So in this animation, you see a range of different colors and it's showing each month from 1984 through present. And the darker gray colors are showing you younger sea ice that's about one or two years old. Whereas the brightest white colors here are showing you the oldest sea ice that's, as, that's older than four years. So the way to understand the age of the sea ice is that every year 
during summertime, sea ice melts, and during wintertime, uh, sea ice freezes up and grows. So sea ice that grows during the winter and then melts during the summer, the sea ice that melts during the summer doesn't, let me start over. <laughs> the sea ice that doesn't melt completely during summer and makes it through the summer melt season is said to have aged by one year. So sea ice that is more than four years old has actually lived through at least four summertime seasons. And by watching this animation here as we get closer to present, what you'll see is that the area of the brightest white colors, those that sea ice that's older than four years is declining quite rapidly. In fact, in the beginning of this animation, that oldest, those brightest white colors accounted for about 20% of the total sea ice cover. Whereas now, uh, at the end of this animation, it only accounts for 3%. So we're having a dramatic decline in the amount of oldest sea ice. Now, another reason why I really like to show this animation uh, is because you can see that just how dynamic the Arctic sea ice cover is. There's really at no point during this during this time period where the Arctic ice sea ice sits still. It's really always moving and always folding on itself and uh, and changing. And that that dynamic makes it really interesting to study as well as really hard to predict. <laughs> but the reason why we care so much about the age of the sea ice is because, as I mentioned earlier, it's directly proportional to how thick that sea ice is. And thicker sea ice is much harder to melt than thinner sea ice. So moving into, uh, into present day where we have a much younger sea ice cover, that also means that it's, that it's a thinner sea ice cover, a thinner sea ice cover that's much easier to melt. Now, to, to give you a little bit more uh, info, uh, idea behind the thickness, uh, this oldest sea ice here, the four-year and older sea ice, can be as much as more than 12 feet tall. So that's more than, I know you guys, normally I would say when I, when I talk about this, <laughs> is that I'm six feet tall, six feet six tall, uh, six feet six inches. And so that's like about the same as me standing on top of my shoulders, right? <laughs> so I'm very tall. So that's a lot of ice. But actually, that's uh, that ice is, the oldest ice here is actually taller than an NBA basketball hoop by several feet. Uh, but this youngest sea ice here, that's just a year old, uh, just about a year old, one to two years old, is roughly about six feet tall. So it doesn't even get to probably the ceiling in the room that you're in, let alone an NBA basketball hoop. So the age of the ice corresponds very strongly to how thick it is. So that's why scientists really pay attention to it. So in addition to these changes that we've seen in the Arctic and sea ice cover, we've also seen some dramatic changes in the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, this data that you're seeing here is from NASA's GRACE uh, uh, constellation. It's actually one of the coolest satellites that, that NASA has, I think. And uh, I could talk about it later if anybody wants to ask me about it. But what it's showing us here is that Greenland has lost a significant amount of ice around its edges here, denoted by these red and very dark red colors that you see in the time series. Uh, and on average, since May 2002, the Greenland ice sheet has lost about 280 gigatons or 281 gigatons of mass each year. So to put that into perspective, that's the amount of water in every year that's enough to fill 140 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. Or if you take those Olympic-sized swimming pools and put them side by side, that'll give you a land area of about the size of New York State. So it's, it's a lot of water that's, that's coming off of Greenland every year. Now, what we know is that that water isn't actually uh, filling Olympic-sized swimming pools. <laughs> Rather, it's filling up the ocean. Since 2002, the Greenland ice sheet has accounted for about 25% of the total global sea level rise. And just in particular here, uh, the summer of 2019 was a specifically uh, was an especially large melt event, where on av where it lost about 200 or sorry, excuse me. 532 gigatons of ice. So that's more than twice the average number that I gave you. That specific summer alone, 2019, caused the global sea level to rise by about 1.5 millimeters. I know that may not seem like a lot, but if you were to take that water and place it over top of the state of California, you would cover California with a lake that's four feet deep just from the melt that occurred in the summer of 2019. So NASA has seen a lot of changes in our environment and some especially rapid changes we've seen in the Arctic. Uh, but I'd like to describe kind of the simple science that is behind these changes that we're seeing. 
the key concept to understand here as, as to why our climate is changing, our environment is changing, is called the greenhouse effect. And you may have heard of this before. The greenhouse effect is caused by carbon dioxide and water vapor and a few other molecules in our atmosphere that absorb energy and keep it inside of our climate system. Uh, and it, instead of allowing it to escape out to space, this causes our surface temperature to be warmer than it otherwise would have been without our atmosphere and without the greenhouse effect. And that's what's shown here in this animation. I'll play it a few more times so you can watch. Scientists have understood this phenomenon, the, the greenhouse effect, for almost 200 years. It was first identified by Joseph Foyer, who's a, fr a French physicist. Now, the greenhouse effect itself is a really good thing. <laughs> Without it, Earth's surface would be much, much colder. In fact, it would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit. So if Earth's temperature was that cold, uh, it's likely that the whole planet would be a snowball covered in snow and ice everywhere. And it suffices to say that we actually wouldn't be here if the planet were frozen. So the greenhouse effect is a really important life-giving feature of our atmosphere. But we also need to respect it. It's a very powerful effect. Water vapor and carbon dioxide, again, are the two primary uh, molecules in the atmosphere that deliver this greenhouse effect. Uh, so if either of those were to increase in our atmosphere, the ability of our, of our climate system to cool to space would be reduced, and that would cause the surface temperature to warm. So another way to think about this is that we humans have been on Earth for about 300,000 years, uh, but we've only been polluting like this, putting CO2 into the atmosphere for about the last 60 years. This pol carbon pollution stays in the air for thousands of years, and it's creating this thickening blanket that traps heat in our atmosphere. This extra heat causes more heat waves, stronger hurricanes, bigger fires, more floods, and the extinction of thousands of species. But there is good news. Uh, to, to stop this pollution blanket and the overheating, we just need to stop putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and stop polluting. So let me show you what this overheating looks like from space. So I'm a member of what's called the Ceres Science Team. Ceres here, C-E-R-E-S, stands for Clouds in Earth's Radiant Energy System. And we're in charge of maintaining and continuing a data record that tracks how energy is coming into and leaving and flowing around our planet. Uh, our observations began in 2000, and this animation is showing the total amount of energy that's accumulated within our Earth system over that time. To me, this is really one of the remar most remarkable observations that Ceres has made in its two years of taking measurements from space. If climate were not changing, this line here would be flat. Uh, but what we observe here is a continuous increase in the amount of energy that's being accumulated inside of the climate system. And this accumulation of energy is a direct consequence of the pollution blanket. And again, to stop it, we just need to stop polluting. There is one other factor that we need to consider when it comes to climate change that I really like to highlight because it's really one of the areas that I spend a lot of time thinking about and studying. And there again, there's a lot of research on this topic. And this is what we call uh, within our climate system, within our system, they're called feedbacks or cascading effects. And that is uh, when you change temperature of the, of the earth, other processes change and respond to those temperature changes that can help either amplify or dampen the effects of the initial change. Uh, feedbacks that cause uh, an accelerating effect, we, we rec refer to as amplifying feedbacks. <coughs> so one such feedback that's illustrated in this figure is called the sea ice albedo feedback. As I mentioned to you guys before, the amount of sea ice in the Arctic is changing very rapidly and is declining. And so what you may have noticed from that picture is that sea ice, or from other pictures that you've seen of sea ice, is that sea ice is really bright white. It reflects a lot of sunlight back to space. In fact, if, that, if the sea ice is covered with fresh snow, it can reflect as much as 90% of the sunlight back to space. And all that sunlight that's reflected back to space isn't available to heat the surface. So as sea ice melts, we're uncovering the much darker ocean underneath. The darker ocean it reflects only about 6% of the total sunlight. 
And so that means when you uncover the darker ocean, more of that sunlight is absorbed and stays within the ocean. And that warms the surface temperature and then helps to promote further sea ice loss, this amplifying feedback loop. So in this animation, let me play it again for you. What you see, and again, this shows series data. And what you see in blue here are the changes in sea ice, less sea ice. And in red, you're seeing the changes in increased absorbed sunlight. And what you see is the places where the blue colors are from sea ice and the red colors are from the absorbed sunlight are overlapping. So this is direct evidence that we're seeing and measuring this, what we call the sea ice albedo feedback. So this is just one example of feedback loops within our climate system. And I wanted to share this with you because understanding these feedbacks are really key to understanding how fast our climate is going to change in the decades and, and uh, centuries to come. And it's really an exciting area of research. And this feedback uh, in the Arctic is one key example of what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. That's because as more sea ice melts, and the, uh, this causes the whole Earth to get just a little bit warmer. So in addition to the changes in sea ice, I wanted to be able to uh, show you a different example about how what's happening in the Arctic affects the rest of the globe. And one of those examples is our rising oceans. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, as the Greenland ice sheet is melting, that water isn't filling Olympic-sized swimming pools. <laughs> it's filling our ocean. The Greenland ice sheet is a huge mass of ice, right, located on land, but it located in the Arctic. As the Arctic warms, it melts faster and faster. And so this means a warmer Arctic is giving us more of a global sea level rise. In addition to the sea level rise, we know that the ocean is also becoming warmer all around. It's becoming more acidic, and there's less, less oxygen being dissolved in the water. Uh, and so these changes are harmful to both marine mammals as well as fish and humans alike. I'm sure there's a number of folks that are listening, as, as am I, uh, a really big fan of seafood. I enjoy, eating, <laughs> I enjoy eating seafood quite a bit. The changes that we're seeing in the ocean, though, are impacting the productivity of our fisheries and are raising the prices and availability of some of the fish that we like to eat. And that includes both salmon and crab, whitefish, and some other ones. Now, particularly vulnerable uh, are some of the most productive fisheries in the United States, and those are located in and around Alaska. Now, in terms of sea level rise, uh, that's what's shown here on, on the line plot on the right side of the screen. Uh, and so the top panel of that plot shows historical sea level rise uh, since over the last 2,500 years. And so if you follow that uh, bluish line in time, the first thing you see, there's a bunch of little wiggles. But overall, it's a very flat kind of line where we haven't seen any big changes in the global sea level rise. But then over on the right side of that line, starting about uh, 1900, you see that there's very big uptick in the global sea level rise. In that time, since 1900, global sea level rise has changed, has increased by uh, about eight inches. But three of those inches have all happened since 1993. So it's really been this recent acceleration. And in fact, that rate of the increase of, our, of the global ocean over the last 100 years is greater than at any other time in the last 2,800 years. So now another uh, interesting question is, so we've seen this recent sea level rise, but how much will this change in the sea level, uh, how fast will it go in, in the future? So to answer that question, that's a hard question to answer because it depends on how much CO2 gets into the atmosphere and how thick that pollution blanket gets. And that's what's uh, denoted here by the different rainbow colors. The purples, the blue, to green, to red uh, show different sea level rise scenarios based on how much carbon dioxide gets put into the atmosphere. On average, we expect the global sea level rise by 2030 in 10 years to be about 0.3 to 0.6 feet, uh, by 2050 to be about half a foot to 1.2 feet, and by the end of the century, between 1 and 4.3 feet. But if you look really close at that red line there and, and the bottom panel, you see that by 2100, that reaches eight feet of global sea level rise. That's a very big number, especially for us living in coastal regions of the country and small island nations around the world. Now, it's, it's interesting to see that, that there is that uh, eight feet of sea level rise. And the reason it's there is because uh, there's the possibility of some very catastrophic rapid sea level rise because of melting of both Antarctica and Greenland. 
And so we cannot, the science, we cannot rule out the possibility of a very large sea level rise happening by the end of the century. Now, again, here where I live, uh, we pay very close attention <laughs> to these type of, of forecasts uh, because we, we're aware of, we live very closely with the sea and our local economy is very closely tied to our ports in this area. Uh, but there's another really interesting aspect of this besides just the economic, or just the impact on our ports, but the changes in sea level in our area here in Southeast Virginia uh, have a very big impact on how we live our daily lives. So there's a, there's a term that we have here called nuisance flooding. And it's also called uh, sunny day flooding. It's something that happens in a bunch of different coastal cities. Uh, and that includes in Miami and in other places of the country, uh, 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 Charleston and San Francisco. And nuisance flooding is essentially when uh, occurs at high tide and it causes backed up storm drains. Uh, and this can f flood onto the streets and overwhelm storm drains and then come into buildings sometimes and compromise infrastructure. So what's interesting about this phenomenon is that it's beginning to happen a lot more frequently. So if you look at this plot on the left over top of the picture, which is of downtown Norfolk, Virginia, which is very close to where I live, and what you can see in the 1950s is that uh, on average there was about one to two of these minor flooding events that would happen uh, every year. But you see some of those years it never happened. As we fast forward here to 2010, where this current, where the data in this chart here ends, uh, you see that we have on average about eight to 10 of these uh, nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding events per year. And so again, what this does is it closes down roads and can flood buildings and cause a lot of problems uh, and might have to close school for a day or, uh, or divert buses and things like that. And so it's really been, it's really a hassle and really changes uh, how we live in this area. Now, if you look on the right side of this, this is a, a plot, a, a graph from my, my friend at NOAA, Billy Sweet, who I worked with on this report. And what it shows in the different rainbow colors is the changes in the number of these nuisance flooding days that we expect with, at different levels of sea level rise uh, from the darkest blue colors here being uh, like the low sea level rise scenario to the darkest reds, the, the brightest reds being the more the most, most extreme sea level rise, which would involve uh, very large rapid melts of the Antarctic ice sheet. And so, but if we just consider kind of the most uh, likely scenario here, which is the light blue cyan color here in the middle, what you can see is that in my area by, uh, uh, by 2050, we expect not 10 of these days per year, but 50 of these days per year. And that would have a lot of, uh, uh, some big impacts on uh, how, we, how we get around the area and, and how we do business. Uh, by the end of the century, by 2100, that could be as many as 200 days. So more than half of our, the year, we would actually have these streets that would be essentially permanently flooded. So you said these sea level rise changes have very real consequences for uh, a lot of the folks living in coastal regions. And the point I like to, to make and drive home here is that uh, how rapidly these sea level rise changes and the magnitude of these impacts on communities uh, has, is very closely tied to how rapidly the Arctic changes and how much the Greenland ice sheet melts. I, have, I just want to wrap up here with just a, a, few, uh, a few different points. And one is I opened up the, the presentation with talking about these climate changes and how they have big impacts on our community. And I just wanted to uh, lay out a few of those changes here. You know, for instance, with climate change, there'll be increased costs that are associated with adaptation. As I just mentioned in coastal areas with the rising seas, uh, in the end, what this means is that entire towns and cities may have to be relocated, including uh, Shishmaref, Alaska uh, and Tanger Island here in Virginia. Uh, changes in temperatures and precipitation are, are currently and will continue to stress our fresh water supplies. And that makes us more vulnerable to extreme events and extreme heat. Uh, and this influences our ability to work outside and increases medical costs as well. This increases the vulnerability of our food system. Uh, reduced harvest yields can make, uh, due to warmer temperatures, can reduce water availability, uh, as well as result in higher prices for food uh, and other consumer goods. 
Also, uh, in talking to some colleagues at the Department of Defense, uh, military leaders consider climate change a threat multiplier that has the ability to destabilize some already fragile world democracies. You know, the ultimate outcome of all of these climate changes and of the continued thickening of this carbon pollution blanket is really a less healthy uh, human society. So it's important for us to understand that the impacts of climate change are really widespread, spread, multifaceted, and interconnected. So I wanted to touch on a couple, uh, a really a couple important things that we learned and observed last year in particular. Last year, 2020, was a very dramatic year for, for climate change events. And I know because of the pandemic, which I'll talk about on the next slide, uh, we may some of us may have missed it. But last year, there was a, a anomalous level of heat and fires around the country. It was really a theme for 2020. And the United States was, not, uh, was no different. We saw our fair share of fires. In fact, California in particular saw its first gigafire in modern history. Uh, that is a fire that scorches more than 1 million acres. Uh, so this means that this fire actually burned an area larger than the state of Rhode Island. It was called the August Complex Fire, and a picture from NASA imagery is shown up here on, your, on the screen. Uh, and this record-setting fire season began with an unprecedented outbreak of dry lightning. So lightning really started these fires in August 2020. And this culminated in more than 4.1 million acres of the state being burned. And in that year, actually five of the 10 largest fires in California history were actually observed and burnt last year. And the images on the right-hand panel of this screen show, are from Landsat 8. And this shows, uh, data shows the smoke from some of these fires, as well as the shades on the bottom right of tan and brown show you the severity of the burns that we can see from space. So this allows us to study how these fires are impacting our environment from satellites. I also wanted to touch on, because uh, I'm sure you've heard that uh, because of the pandemic and because of the shutdown in some of the economies is that this could have had an impact on climate change. And so we do see that there has been some impact from COVID, uh, from the COVID response. In fact, uh, there's been a, the, it has influenced this pollution blanket of carbon dioxide. And so the most notable change we had from the shutdowns related to COVID were the much cleaner air that we saw around the world. The air quality really increased, and that was because there was much less traffic on the roads and a lot of reductions in manufacturing. Uh, associated with COVID, though, the because of the reduction in manufacturing and fewer cars and less air travel, there was an overall reduction last year of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere of about 6.4%, and they, over the previous year, over 2019, and that is really great news. However, I also wanted to point out the fact that that's not really the whole story. You know, overall, this reduction in CO2 really has little effect on the overall pollution blanket. Uh, in fact, last year, taking into account all of emissions, uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere actually went up, even though we were reduced, had reduced emissions relative to the previous year. So if you put that pi in pictures, if you look at the stack of bricks on the right-hand side of the screen, you see that the height of the bricks, each of these bricks, denotes the amount of carbon dioxide emissions each year. And so you can really hardly tell the difference between the brick in 2020 versus the brick in 2019. Uh, so overall, the, while the amount of CO2 emissions went down in 2020, it hasn't had a big impact yet. If we want to make a really big impact, on, on climate change, we need to continue these drops in emission uh, year after year until we get until we get to uh, zero, essentially. So the last kind of thing I'll cover is a question I get a lot, and it's and I'd love to have some more questions. Is what can I do personally? How can I make a difference? And so there's a lot of a number of things that you can do, uh, but all of them in order to tackle this problem really boils down to. Uh, reducing our carbon footprint and stopping polluting and re to reduce the thickness of that carbon blanket. A couple other things that we can do is uh, vote people into office who support climate change policies. Uh, also, it's interesting to think about our money and the way we spend it. It's just like a vote. 
Uh, when we spend it, it, the way we spend our money reinforces company behavior. That's the way capitalism is set up. That's how it works. But in this case, we can actually take advantage of it uh, and purchase from responsible companies that use sustainable practices that limit their emissions. Some other personal actions that, that I've undertaken that I would uh, recommend everybody else do as well is you can opt in for 100% renewable sources of electricity from your power company. You can also travel less, which COVID, uh, the pandemic, has certainly helped with. Uh, we can also consume less, reduce waste. And also, we can start uh, a compost pile in our backyards. That, so compost our food waste. It actually makes it much better than sending it to the landfill. So in closing, you know, in my purpose on Earth, I think, is to understand our climate and then to communicate how our climate affects our community and how our actions in turn affect our climate so that all of us can live better lives. This is a mantra that I share with NASA in that our work is really for all of humankind. So what's your purpose on Earth? Think about that when you go to bed tonight. Uh, knowing that will really help you make a bigger difference, a bigger impact in this world. I also challenge each of you to go and learn more about the world around you and then to share that knowledge with your neighbors and with your community. Communicating how our food, energy, water, and energy systems really work shouldn't solely rest on the shoulders of scientists. It's really the job of elected officials, policymakers, the media, teachers, parents, really all of us have that responsibility. So please take this away from way with you. Uh, we live on an interconnected planet. And this means that our actions affect the lives of others, others that we will never meet. The best piece of advice that I can give you is to always consider and follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The interconnectedness of our climate system means that our actions affect everyone else around the world. And if everybody internalized that concept and implemented it into our daily decisions, we could make this world a better place, just one small decision at a time. Every day, NASA data provides a keener, clearer illustration of just how interconnected our planet is. And this means that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. These data are vital to helping scientists solve the most pressing science questions and to help society thrive on this changing and interconnected planet. Thanks.